What I did is something for 52 years. They've been trying to get Roe v. Wade into the states. And through the uh, genius and, and heart and strength of six Supreme Court justices, we were able to do that. Now, I believe in the exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. I believe strongly in it. Ronald Reagan did also. 85% of Republicans do. In over 20 states, there are Trump abortion bans, which make it criminal for a doctor or nurse to provide health care in one state, it provides prison for life. Trump abortion bans that make no exception even for rape and incest, which understand what that means. A survivor of a crime of violation to their body does not have the right to make a decision about what happens to their body next. And I pledge to you, when Congress passes a bill to put back in place the protections of Roe v. Wade as president of the United States, I will proudly sign it into law. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, that was former President Trump and Vice President Harris talking about abortion in the ABC News debate. Polls have consistently shown abortion as one of the top issues in this election. So today we're taking a deep dive on that topic, breaking down the candidates' positions, how the landscape has changed since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, and where abortion rights are on the ballot in this election. At least 21 states have passed restrictions since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022. While supporters of the restrictions say they've saved innocent lives, they've also put some pregnant women in serious danger. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has more on that. Hey, Diane, well, at least 20 states have banned or severely restricted access to abortion. And in many of these states, they do have exceptions for rape, for incest, for life of the mother. But what about health of the mother? Diane Sawyer and I teamed up and we spoke to 18 women from 10 different states who painted a picture of a dire and emergency health care crisis in this country. Women who revealed that they were pushed to the brink of death because of their laws in the state and also doctors who said they could not help their patients even though they wanted to. Take a listen to what they told us. So the exact words were, we have to prove to the ethics board and the medical board of this hospital that your life is in danger before we could intervene. Our doctor, our nurses were crying at our bedside, at my bedside, mm -hmm. wishing they could do something with blank stares on their faces because they literally couldn't do anything until the blood work showed that I was dying. And in what world does that make any sense to prevent health care for me? Yeah. What about my life? Diane, many of these women speaking out to share their stories because they want something to change in this country. We know that at least some states have tried, others have failed to get exceptions in there for health of the mother. But in this political climate now, where you have several states, including some key battlegrounds that will have abortion rights on the ballot, it is pushing this issue front and center once again in this critical election year. Diane. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And Vice President Harris is expected to focus on abortion rights as she heads to Texas tomorrow, while former President Trump is defending his position on the issue. Let's bring in ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey for more on how both campaigns are tackling the topic of abortion. Elizabeth Harris says she would sign a bill to reinstate the protections of Roe v. Wade. But in the ABC debate, she wouldn't answer if she supports any abortion restrictions. So what would it take for an abortion rights bill to pass in Congress along the lines of what uh, Harris is saying she wants? And what else could she do as president without Congress? Well, and Diane, Vice President Harris has really centered her campaign around restoring reproductive rights, including codifying Roe into federal law. But as we've seen over the past two years, Congress has not done that so far. What she has said she would push to do is actually eliminate the filibuster rule, that rule in the Senate that typically requires 60 votes. She would lower that threshold to try to boost the likelihood of federal abortion law that would protect those restrictions that were protected under Roe. As far as other steps she could take, Diane, we could see her double down on some of what the administration has already done when it comes to executive action. So trying to use their existing authority under federal laws, for example, to say that women should have the right to an abortion because of emergency laws that are already in place across the states at the federal level, because of uh, mail-in laws that allow you to mail prescriptions for abortion. We've seen them try to use that authority. And then there's, of course, the legal route. We have also seen this administration take on some of those states that have strict bans in place, 
So far, though, of course, none of that has been able to restore at the federal level what the vice president is ultimately calling for. And the reality is she would need Congress to do that. We are looking at a very high likelihood that this would be a divided government, and that would be very tough for her, Diane. And, Elizabeth, this is a slight sidetrack, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But she has lost support from some in her own party or moderates mm -hmm. on the fence because of that filibuster issue. So just explain yeah. the potential repercussions of that, because that wouldn't just apply to abortion. Right. And she has said she wanted to apply to abortion. But of course, that's been one of the challenges with any Democrat supporting getting rid of that rule is, well, what other rules would it apply to? And then, of course, if Democrats don't have control of the Senate, wouldn't then Republicans then go ahead and pass other laws? So we've seen moderates take the stand of generally they don't support getting rid of that rule. But this is where the vice president's really trying to rock that fine line, trying to appeal to those moderates, but also the progressives in her party who want something done at the federal level. Uh, meanwhile, Trump says abortion should be a state issue. He has said that he doesn't support a national ban. But in that ABC News debate, he would not commit to vetoing a national ban mm -hmm. if Congress were to pass one. So based on what he said so far, what would abortion policy look like under a second Trump administration? This is a tightrope for former President Donald Trump, Diane. He has wavered on this issue. Ultimately, where he's landed right now is that this is up to the state. So unlikely we would see him try to push through any federal legislation. He has said he would not support, he would veto a federal ban on abortion. But at the same time, he has expressed support for pretty strong restrictions, including in his state of Florida, where he will vote, where they were going to vote on the current six-week ban. That's almost a total ban on abortion. He has said he will basically vote to keep that in place. So he has gone back and forth on this. We know that he understands that a lot of voters, this is an edge where Harris does have a lead on the former president. But at the same time, he is trying to appeal to his base. And we've heard him multiple times throughout this campaign, Diane, tout the fact that he nominated three of the Supreme Court justices who ultimately did overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, earlier this year, Alabama passed a law restoring IVF after the state Supreme Court ruled frozen embryos are people. Now, Harris's running mate, Tim Walls, has been open about his family's fertility journey. Mm -hmm. Trump has called himself the father of IVF and even at one point promised to get the government or insurance to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So where do the candidates stand on that issue? And could what happened in Alabama happen in other states as well? We have seen access to IVF be such a center point in this issue in a way that wasn't expected because of that Alabama case and the risk, at least what Democrats warn, that that could happen in other states. Because remember, the reason that clinics in Alabama were forced to pause those fertility treatments, those IVF treatments, was because the state Supreme Court basically said that frozen embryos, which is a typical part of the IVF process, that discarding those embryos is part of the process, would, is, wouldn't be allowed. Essentially, the doctors could be liable for a crime because of that. And their basis for that legal decision back in Alabama was using the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe. So, Democrats, including Tim Walls, who has talked about his family's fertility journey, as you say, though he has faced a little bit of criticism for talking about their IVF journey when we now know they underwent IUI, which is a little bit different of a process, doesn't involve those frozen embryos. The, the, the message from the, the Harris campaign and from Tim Walls has been this could happen in other states if we don't protect into federal law the right to fertility treatments like IVF. And former President Trump has recognized that public support is very broad for those fertility treatments. And so he has come out in full throated support of those of IVF saying he's the father of those treatments, but it's it's also not exactly clear. And you listen to what he said after that, it's not clear he exactly knew what was going on until he found out what was going on in Alabama from the senator there, Katie Britt. So what's what this has underscored is just how far of limitations they want to put on reproductive rights. Democrats say there is no limitation to what Republicans might do. Republicans have pushed back pretty hard on that narrative, Diane. All right, ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey, thank you. Meanwhile, doctors and other healthcare workers say they're struggling to care for patients due to multiple changes in restrictions. I want to bring in Dr. Bhavik Kumar, an abortion provider, speaking on behalf of the Committee to Protect Healthcare's Reproductive Freedom Task Force. He's also the Chief Medical Officer for Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio. Dr. Kumar, thanks for coming on. I know you provide medical care, including abortions in Ohio, but you also work in Texas, where abortions are outlawed with few exceptions. So what are you seeing in your practice, and how how are these restrictions affecting how you provide care for your patients? 
Yeah, good morning. I've been in Texas for a number of years providing abortion care, and we've dealt with a number of restrictions, including Senate Bill 8 and then Dobbs decision, which has really shut down most, if not all, abortion care in Texas. And I also work in Ohio, where many of those similar restrictions have been taken down. What I've seen in Texas is that people continue to need access to abortion care. Unfortunately, they're not able to get that care here in the state, so they're being forced to travel to other states if they're able to. Many people are not, and that means that they're forced to continue those pregnancies against their will. And most of those people are forced to give birth and parent children that they know that they can't provide for. So folks that are sick, it's even scarier because we're not able to get them the care that they need. And sometimes they're getting sicker, closer to death before physicians and healthcare providers can intervene. And that's precisely what we as healthcare providers don't want. We want to prevent those outcomes. We wanna help people make sure that they're healthier and better and able to exercise their rights to their own body and make their own decisions. Now, former President Trump has accused Democrats of wanting to allow abortions up to and including the nine month of pregnancy. And so far the Harris campaign hasn't voiced support for any abortion restrictions. So from a medical standpoint, what's your view on performance Forming abortions that late in a pregnancy? And do you think it's possible to impose any abortion restrictions without jeopardizing the medical care of pregnant women? Yeah, what I would say as somebody who does provide this care and has seen thousands of people, has had the privilege of taking care of them, hearing their stories, their names, is that I know that people that make decisions about abortion are making thoughtful decisions. They're considering what's best for them, their family. They are, take these choices and decisions seriously, and they're putting a lot of thought about what's best for them. It's also important to note the fact that about 92% of abortions are really early in the first trimester. So this is definitely a political talking point when we start talking about later abortion. Ultimately, as a physician who has heard thousands of stories, I trust my patients to make the decisions that are best for them at any point in pregnancy. But we really have to talk about the reality of what's happening with abortion bans and restrictions where people don't get access to the care and really move away from these divisive conversations about later abortions because it really is designed to evoke emotions and other things. And we're not really talking about the reality of what's happening when we ban abortion, which is that people aren't able to exercise their rights to their own body and make decisions that are best for them and their families. So do you see cases where it's medically necessary to perform an abortion later on in, in the pregnancy at that stage? Yeah, of course, with the states where I provide care, we're providing up to the state limit. So in Ohio, that's um, 21 weeks and six days. Texas had a similar law, but now there are three abortion bans. So it's rare for many of us to see abortions that are that late in pregnancy, especially where the folks in the political realm were talking about it. However, there are places in the country where we can refer folks and that care can be provided safely. Um, but again, it's a pretty rare circumstance where that happens and 92% of abortions are happening in the first trimester. And Dr. Kumar, very quickly, I, I, I'm out of time, but I just wanna ask you, some supporters of restrictions say it's not just about protecting the life of the fetus, it's about protecting the mental well-being and physical well-being of the mother because of the repercussions abortion can have. Can you just quickly speak to that? Sure, we know from studies that when we deny people abortion care, they do have worse outcomes, both for their physical health and their mental health. So abortion actually saves lives and makes their outcomes better, but also makes the outcomes for the children that they probably have at home better as well. So we know this uh, information and it's important that we remind ourselves about it, um, especially when we're two weeks away from the election. All right, Dr. Bobby Kumar, we appreciate your time today, thank you. And in less than two weeks, voters in 10 states will have the chance to make their voices heard about abortion access in their state. ABC News senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer joins me now for more on that. Devin, what's at stake in these 10 states and what's in these ballot measures? Yeah, those 10 states, Diane, are proposals to amend state constitutions on abortion. Now, several of the states, and I think we have a map, uh, include uh, Maryland, Colorado, New York. They already allow uh, pretty expansive abortion access. These measures would formalize that in the Constitution. But most of the states you see there have strict abortion bans right now. So these amendments would override those laws. South Dakota, Missouri, that right now prohibited only in cases of emergency, Florida, 
six weeks. You heard Elizabeth talk about that. Nebraska, Arizona, illegal after about the first trimester. So if these measures are approved, uh, they would be guaranteeing access in those states up to fetal viability. That's about 24 weeks. And it would be much harder to change the law if it's written into the Constitution. If these amendments, Diane, are not approved, not passed, and not adopted, then the bans you saw there on the screen would likely remain in place for some time. So a lot on the line. Since the Supreme Court handed down that Dobbs decision, uh, we've seen the battle in state legislatures. We've seen the battle in state courts. These ballot measures are putting the issue of abortion directly to the voters, and that's why it's so significant to watch. And former President Trump, Devin, has shifted his position on whether he supports Florida's abortion amendment. He initially indicated he would vote for this measure to repeal the state's six-week abortion ban, saying you need more time than six weeks. Now he says he's voting against that measure. What does that tell you about how tricky this issue is politically? It's a balancing act for Trump and Republicans. Obviously, he, knew he needs to shore up support among women voters, but he also needs to preserve support, uh, consolidate support among those anti-abortion Christian conservatives. So very trickly, more broadly though, Diane, I think what this issue uh, is worth watching very closely for is how will the politics of the abortion amendments impact the vote for candidates on the ballot? There's some evidence to suggest that by having these measures on the ballot and some key states, Arizona, Florida, you could see a drive and turnout for Democrats. On the other hand, uh, polling shows a clear gap, Diane, between support for these pro-abortion amendments and support for Kamala Harris and Democratic Senate candidates. There is a discrepancy there. So support for one does not necessarily mean support for the other. And analysts I've talked to say there's some evidence that voters may be segregating their views on abortion, voting in favor of a constitutional amendment in these places, for example, while also supporting Republican candidates on the issues of the economy and immigration. So we'll have to see uh, a very complicated picture uh, as these emerge on November 5th. All right, ABC News senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer, thank you.